when people say we well, don't believe in global warming, I say no, I believe in global warming. I don't believe that, that human CO2 is causing that warming. A few years ago, if you would ask me, I would tell you it's CO2. Why? Because just like everyone else in the public, I uh, listened to what the uh, media had to say. We're looking at the ice core record from Vostok, and in the red we see temperature going up from early time to later time at a very key interval when we came out of a glaciation. And we see the temperature going up, and then we see the CO2 coming up. CO2 lags behind that increase. It's got an 800 year lag. So temperature is leading CO2 by 800 years. There have now been several major ice core surveys. Every one of them shows the same thing. The temperature rises or falls, and then, after a few hundred years, carbon dioxide follows. So obviously, carbon dioxide is not the cause of that warming. In fact, we can say that the warming produced the increase in carbon dioxide. CO2 clearly cannot be causing temperature changes. It's a product of temperature. It's following temperature change. Volcanoes produce more CO2 each year than all the factories and cars and planes and other sources of man-made carbon dioxide put together. More still comes from animals and bacteria, which produce about 150 gigatons of CO2 each year, compared to a mere six and a half gigatons from humans. An even larger source of CO2 is dying vegetation, from falling leaves, for example, in the autumn. But the biggest source of CO2 by far is the oceans. Carl Wunsch is professor of oceanography at MIT. He was also visiting professor in oceanography at Harvard University and University College London, and a senior visiting fellow in mathematics and physics at the University of Cambridge. He is the author of four major textbooks on oceanography. The ocean is the major reservoir into which carbon dioxide goes when it comes out of the atmosphere or to, from which it is re-emitted to the, the atmosphere. If you heat the surface of the ocean, it tends to emit carbon dioxide. So similarly, if you cool the ocean surface, the ocean can dissolve more carbon dioxide. Look in the sky. Look at that massive thing, the sun. Even humans at our present six and a half billion are minute relative to that. In the late 1980s, solar physicist Piers Corbin decided to try a radically new way of forecasting the weather. Despite the huge resources of the official Met Office, Corbin's new technique consistently produced more accurate results. He was hailed in the national press as a super weatherman. The secret of his success was the sun. The origin of our solar weather technique of long-range forecasting came originally from study of sunspots and a desire to predict those. And then I realized it was actually much more interesting to use the sun to predict the weather. Sunspots, we now know, are intense magnetic fields which appear at times of higher solar activity. But for many hundreds of years, long before this was properly understood, astronomers around the world used to count the number of sunspots in the belief that more spots heralded warmer weather. In 1893, the British astronomer Edward Maunder observed that during the Little Ice Age, there were barely any spots visible on the sun, a period of solar inactivity which became known as the Maunder Minimum. But how reliable are sunspots as an indicator of the weather? Okay, boy. I decided to test it by gambling on the weather through William Hill against what the Met Office said was a, you know, a normal expectation. And I won money month after month after month after month. Last winter the Met Office said it could be or would be an exceptionally cold winter. We said no, that is nonsense, it's going to be very close to normal. And we specifically said when it would be cold, i.e. after Christmas and February. We were right, they were wrong. In 1991, senior scientists at the Danish Meteorological Institute decided to compile a record of sunspots in the 20th century and compare it with the temperature record. 
What they found was an incredibly close correlation between what the sun was doing and changes in temperature on Earth. Solar activity, they found, rose sharply to 1940, fell back for four decades until the 1970s, and then rose again after that.